there. Again, I do want to just uh, welcome Judy Laufer, who many of you may know through her books. She's very active in the community, her and her husband, um, Dr. Nathan Laufer. So you might know them through different uh, organizations that they partner with or volunteer with or support. Um, but today we have Judy, who is an author, also publishes books. She has done a number of books that she's going to speak about. I know that she's uh, going to speak about Choices First, which is a book that is the one that we featured in the email. So I'm going to let Judy uh, steal the show and share about her books, how she became an author, why this is her passion, and then we can ask questions of interest that you uh, either have already because you've read the books or because you're learning about it now and want to know more information. So I'm going to share this uh, mic now with Judy. All right. Judy. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, what a wonderful organization SOS is. We've come to become acquainted with it uh, just a few years ago, but I know it's been going on for a long time. And uh, kudos to you. You've done an amazing job in the community. So um, I want to say hello to everybody and um, just share with you that this is my first Zoom video. So bear with me. Um, I'm going to do this uh, in sort of three parts. So one is a little bit about me, the author, a little bit about how I developed the publishing company, and a little bit about uh, Choices, which is the book that the rabbi was talking about, and then the other books that are available and projects that we're working on right now. So I'm going to start with um, a little bit about me. I am uh, an early childhood development person. That is my background. I worked as a kindergarten teacher. And the books that I worked on first were children's books. There were a lot of issues that I was concerned with in social emotional development for young children. And uh, there were a lot of topics that hadn't been addressed or hadn't been addressed, addressed for the young audience. Uh, the first book I wrote was a book helping young children deal with grief. It was about a little girl whose grandfather died. I wrote it when my dad passed away and I was teaching at the time. I was teaching in Montreal, Canada, which is where I grew up. Um, I was born in Budapest, Hungary. Um, and um, the, the topic of death was difficult. Many children would come to school and somebody in their family had passed away, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle. Of course, uh, that was almost 30 years ago. And since then, with what's happening in the world, of course, there are more issues surrounding grief and death. And um, usually people do not want to talk to young children about that because it is a difficult topic. And I wanted to provide a story that would give parents, teachers, counselors, doctors, um, the opportunity to use a story as a platform for discussion. So in talking to a child, if they've had some kind of situation, um, letting them know that other people go through the same thing, what are the feelings they're going to experience, um, basically leaving with them with a positive, uh, a positive thought which is even though the person's gone, the memories live on. So um, it is still one of my best-selling books. It, I'm contacted very often internationally from people who heard about the book and have a situation where they have a child that has somebody passed away and they can't find a book. At the time that I wrote the book, most of the books dealt with the seasons changing or um, a pet dying. And for my niece, who was five at the time, and for many other children that I taught in kindergarten, that they couldn't relate to that, that, that they understood that that was part of life, um, but it was too abstract. They wanted a story about someone. So since then, there have been other books written uh, for children about people who die. But this is done very simplistically, and um, I think even if there, you have another book, it's always good to have other sources. So that book is this right here, 
And it actually sells at the Chabad store in Scottsdale as well. So if you want to pick that up, it is available there. Actually, all my books are right now, as well as online and on our website. And I'll give you that information later. So this was my first book. It was over 30 years ago. So uh, with that book, um, a lot of people said to me, you know, there's so many other issues that children go through. Are you going to be writing some more books? And um, I decided, you know, it's an area that I really liked. I used to do a lot of writing. I did a lot of creative writing as an elementary student. And I was always fascinated by what was in someone's imagination and how we create, how we could create stories for young children that are imaginative and fun. So the next topic that came up in my kindergarten was, was nightmares. So around five, four or five, sometimes earlier, sometimes later, but around that time, children have nightmares. And um, this actually happened to me. I woke up one day, I mean, I woke up and I was laughing and my husband turned to me and he said, okay, so you're either the most well-adjusted person or you're crazy. I'm hoping that it's well adjusted. Um, anyway, uh, I thought, how great would that be if children woke up with a laugh mare, which is what I called it, it was called a laugh mare. And that started my second book. So I thought, let me see if I can turn nightmares into laugh mares. It's something that many children have. It's a lot of things. It's uh, things that often families have to deal with. And how nice is it? when a child wakes up in a good mood, it sets the whole mood for the whole family. So the second book was called Last Night I Had a Laugh Mirror. And that's this book right here. And it's a funny, happy book. It's set in the magical land of Giggleyville, which is what I created. In Giggleyville, you have laugh mirrors and children can go to sleep at night that's actually when they visit Giggleyville. So that's a good way to get children to sleep. You tell them that, you know, you're gonna read them a story and they get to go to Giggleyville and they're in Giggleyville all night until the morning. So that helps them, reassures them that it's actually fun to go to sleep and something that they would want to do. This book um, has been out for about five years. Um, I entered it into a, um, a program that awards children's books. It's called the Moonbeam Children's Book Award. The book won the Moonbeam Children's Book Award. It's a notable children's book. And of course that really helps with people recognizing it. And the bookstores were more interested in carrying it once it's an award winning book. By the way, the first book as well I entered in a poetry contest because it's written in poetry and um, it won the gold, gold Poet Award in New York. And so that was 30 years ago. Um, the books are very much, this Giggleyville series is very much Dr. Seuss meets Walt Disney. And those were two of my interesting people that, um, that I wanted to emulate. So Walt Disney, I love their, his color and um, fantasy. And Dr. Seuss, I love the crazy characters and the funny rhymes. So all of the books are done in that very Dr. Seuss-ish kind of script and also very colorful and bright, as you can see. So the next book was um, a book about birthdays because we know children I love birthdays. Birthdays are very important to children. And again, I wanted to give it a little bit of a different twist. And this book is, What's Your Birthday Wish? And uh, it's about a new character from Giggleyville. The new character is Arthur Fish. This guy here is Arthur Fish. And Arthur Fish is gonna tell us about his birthday wish. So um, this book talks about really Tikkun Olam. That's really what this covers. It's about wishing for things that are bigger than us. It's not wishing for toys or clothes or things about us. It's wishing for big world wishes. So in other words, um, wishing that everybody could be nice to each other and wishing that we could heal everybody in the world, that we could heal all the sickness in the world. 
And uh, so this is a great, again, all of my books are meant to be discussion starters, platforms for discussion. Um, so that was this one. And then the last one so far that's come out, and all these books are available, and all of them are actually available locally at Chabad and also online. So the next one was Shabbat, because I thought, you know, that's a, a celebration that we had at our house growing up that I really liked. And I thought, how fun would it be to make Shabbat as fun as we could make it? So this is Shabbat with all of the rituals that Shabbat has, but also with some funny features. So again, written in rhyme, Dr. Seuss, Walt Disney-ish. And, um, you know, the Shabbat table has funny legs, the dishes are a different shape, the candlesticks bend over, um, the challah, instead of having two long challahs or two round challahs, it's one long one one round, um, just as something to make it a little more fun. And um, again, meant to be a discussion starter. This one really covers the topic of um, inclusiveness. So whether you have a family member that celebrates Jew Shabbat or is Jewish, they can come to your Shabbat table. Anyone can come to your Shabbat table and celebrate Shabbat with you. So those are the children's books. And uh, that actually launched my publishing company, which is Little Egg Publishing, and uh, that's where I publish my books from. Um, I was happily doing children's books when um, one visit that I had with my mom, my mom is now uh, 92, turning 93 uh, this May, uh, she talked about, uh, which she had often, the experience of her leaving Hungary. She was a, both my parents were Holocaust survivors and then got caught in 1956 when Russia invaded Hungary. So they were then trapped in Hungary and things were desperate at the time. There were bombings. Uh, they didn't know there, there were food shortages. It was very, it was another very difficult time. So you can imagine they had survived the Holocaust and now they were caught in the Hungarian Revolution. So um, she was telling me about the, how they had escaped and she had talked to me about this before, but for some reason, um, it now resonated with me. And I decided that, you know, it might be time to write the book. She was 88, turning 88 at the time, 87 turning 88. And I thought, what a great gift for her 90th birthday that we would have uh, a legacy, something for our family, the story. Uh, she also told me about uh, this very important character that's in the book. And here's the book, cover of the book. So you can see it for some of the people who have not read it and have not seen it. Um, there was a character, there was a person that helped them that uh, her name was Anna Marie. And Anna Marie lived in Vienna. And when my parents finally got to Vienna, they were instrumental in keeping my parents alive, basically. So um, I was able to contact her. She is still alive. She was 16 when she met my family. I was almost two. And um, I was able to reach out to her through the internet. And I was able to get her side of the story as well, which I was able to incorporate in the book. Um, This is Anna Marie and her family at the time. There's another photo. This is me. I actually got to meet her. And some of you might have seen the stories in the Jewish news. Hang on one second. So um, that was the reason to write this book. I'm wondering if I can see some of the people and if you can raise your hand if you've read the book. <laughs> well, I, I see hands. Judy, I, you're using your I phone. I can't see too. anyone. Right. You'll need a swipe with your finger, but Lori Steen, Marion Hilton have read it. Um, I, didn't <laughs> catch, I didn't catch every hand, but uh, you got two right uh, here. Um, am I on still? Oh, and of course your husband did. <laughs> May I just say, um, we read it at our Temple High book club and 
um, you came and presented Judy to um, a nice size group at Temple High in our small sanctuary. And uh, you, so you read the book. Uh huh. And were there any questions that you had after reading the book? No, not really. I think uh, I got them all answered between, um, I think in our book club, I got them all answered. We oh, came good. to some conclusions. Oh, great, great. So um, anyone else in the, who is listening? Let me just see who's on. Oh, I can't, I guess I can't see it. No, I guess I can't. Okay. So um, yes, I've presented at several book clubs. I've presented at schools. Um, I've presented um, internationally at the Holocaust Museum in Montreal. Um, I've presented uh, at a, the synagogue in Montreal. The book has gone actually worldwide. So I've had people who have uh, contacted me that have read it literally all over the world, which is very exciting. Um, it was quite an accomplishment for me, just for my own family, to have the story uh, written so that we all had the complete story. Because for years, we would hear about it in bits and pieces. And you know, when you hear about a story that's, um, that's bits and pieces, it's really not the same when you see the things put together. The other goal for writing this book was to appeal to young adults. Many young adults, I go off to schools, a lot of middle schools, uh, junior high schools, and um, they're fascinated by this story. They know about the Holocaust, they've heard about the Holocaust, but they really didn't hear about the Hungarian Revolution. And many of them would ask me, so did people know about the Hungarian Revolution? Um, and interestingly enough, when I did my research, the cover of Time magazine at the time was about the freedom fighters in, during the Hungarian Revolution. So yes, in fact, everybody knew, um, but clearly it wasn't as big an event as the Holocaust, not as many people died, but 200,000. So let me say that again, 200,000 people escaped Hungary during the Hungarian Revolution. Obviously, most of them not Jewish. So it's a very interesting story for, um, for all different faiths. Um, so that was kind of, um, that, was it, that was exciting. And then of course I entered it into a book contest and it won the silver medal award for young adult, young adult readers, which I'm very proud to tell you. And um, I've heard from many teachers, I've heard from many students and um, I think it, it captured uh, that piece of history really well. Yes, I see Rabbi Levy says, if you have any questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's a story uh, that was interesting, uh, also interesting at the, at the time that the book came out, which was just a couple of years ago. And when the, new, when the world or the world news was filled with Russia. Russia had done, how Russia was um, involved in the world, what they were doing, uh, what, kinds, what kind of problems people were having. And here's a story about Russia that invaded Hungary, took over Hungary. So originally the Russians and the Americans were the allies during World War II. And so many of the Hungarians saw them as their friends until all of a sudden they decided that instead of just helping the Hungarians, they were gonna take over Hungary. And, um, and that didn't go over so well. So um, again, it was um, imagine for my parents who were survivors that they survived the, the Holocaust. My mother was uh, a survivor of Auschwitz and my father was in a labor camp. And my mother, she was the only survivor of her whole family. She's the only one that survived. She came back to Hungary because she thought perhaps somebody made a mistake and maybe somebody survived. Uh, she didn't know about her father. Her father had gone off uh, to a labor camp and didn't go to Auschwitz with the rest of the family. So she, in the back of her mind, she always hoped that when she got back to Hungary, that perhaps she would find him. 
She, however, never did, unfortunately. So imagine that, and then only one decade later, so just about 10 years later, um, this other world event happens, and they just got settled in Hungary. They just, my mother had just got married, she had two young children, and life was pretty good until uh, the latter part of 1955, early 1956. Um, and then all of a sudden, everything was turned upside down. And, um, and they felt again, they would be threatened. And um, for, for my mother especially, I think she had a lot of uh, memories of the Holocaust, which wasn't that far, far away when people had said, it's never gonna happen, it's never gonna happen, don't worry. You know, it's never gonna happen here in Hungary. And here she is again, faced with another situation where she's thinking that, um, you know, maybe it is another Holocaust. People are saying, that this is no problem either, and it's going to be fine, and don't worry. Um, yet they're seeing uh, upheaval day after day, and the tanks roll in to Hungary, and there's uh, fighting on the street, and people are saying, no, 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 it's not really that bad. Well, it was pretty bad. And as I say, 200,000 people felt it was bad enough that they had to leave. So, um, so... That was, that's, uh, that's this book. It's also meant for young adult readers. So again, you know, I wrote it. It's not a very long book. It's easy to read. It's um, very much, you know, I really wanted to create the book that people would read saying, well, what happened next? What happened next? What happens next? And um, I think from my readers, I have achieved that. So um, it is a great book to read right now since we're all home and uh, you have some time. And it's a great book to recommend for your uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Um, anyone really uh, 11, 12 and up will really enjoy this book. So um, anyone with questions, I would love to answer some questions. I like, uh, I'm very much inter interactive. It's a little difficult uh, with Zoom. Um, and it is my first Zoom call, so I actually can't see any of you at the moment. <laughs> so Judy, question for you. Was your mom in the, a Holocaust survivor as well? Sorry, say that again? Was your mother a Holocaust survivor as well? Yes, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. She was, Aus she was in Auschwitz. She survived Auschwitz, and she was the only survivor of her family. So... Um, you know, interesting story that actually uh, I think is a little bit in the book, but um, it, you know, she arrived there. She was, uh, you know, it's the typical story of the families were separated at the train tracks and, um, you know, her, all her family went, went on one side, she was put on the other side and not realizing that that meant that they were going to be killed. Um, she just thought she was going to see them later. There was music playing and, uh, you know, they say goodbye to each other, really like, oh, we'll see you later this afternoon. I'm sure we'll catch up. And um, she got to her barrack and to her bunk. And there was a woman there who was a Polish woman who had been there longer because the Polish people were taken earlier. The Hungarians were the last group that were transferred to the camps and um, the last country that was one of the last countries that was invaded by the Germans. So uh, she got there, this woman had been there for several years. And uh, she said to my mother, she goes, did you come by yourself? And she goes, no, my family's here. And my mother goes, yeah, I'm gonna see them later. And um, she, says, she says, well, she goes, take a look outside. You see that black smoke? My mother goes, yes. She goes, well, that's where they are. Yes, the books are available. I just see a question from uh, Rabbi Levi. Can you put that question up again? Because it just flashed by my screen. Hello? Sorry, about so Judy is asking, do all your books have a Jewish thread or just choices and the Shabbat book? 
Uh, all of the books have a Jewish thread in the sense that they're social emotional issues for young children. And uh, so, for instance, the birthday book was really Tikkun Olam. So that's the, the thread there. Um, the uh, Where Did Papa Go is helping young children deal with grief. And, um, and that, again, you know, something that we deal with. And the idea that there is a heaven is, is uh, part of the Jewish religion. And, um, yeah, that we want kids to, you know, we talk about when somebody dies, somebody says, um, we hope their memory will be a blessing to you. Well, this is really about their memory and their memory being a blessing to you. So it does cover that. Uh, my newest book actually out is uh, Hidden Pearl, and that came out uh, about a year ago, and it won the gold medal award for young adult readers, so very proud of that, and that this is actually a Holocaust story. So the other book was about the Hungarian Revolution, but my mom is a survivor. This one is about my husband's mother, and she was a hidden child during the war, so much like Anne Frank, but not hidden in an attic, but hidden out in the open with a family. So they didn't know she was Jewish. She was put with this family uh, through the kindness of uh, a stranger. And he knew she was Jewish. She did, he didn't tell anyone else. And he hid her with this family, 10 years old. She had to take on a different identity. And um, she lived with the family for several years until the war was over, never knew if she would see her family again. Um, and fascinating story as well. Again, written for young adults. It's not a long book. Um, I just received yesterday a note from one of my readers, and they said, they, when they picked up, they, got, they thought, wow, I wonder how you're going to cover this whole story in such a short book. And she was surprised at the end and said that it was really amazing how much she learned from the book so, and from the story. So again, Yom HaShoah was last week. It's a great book to talk to kids about the Holocaust. Um, that is the newest book out. Anyone read this book, by the way? It is also at Chabad, it's online, it's on our website. Our website is www.littleeggpublishing.com. We're on Facebook, Little Egg Reads, Instagram, Little Egg, at Little Egg Reads. Um, it's also on Amazon, so you can look it up on Amazon by the title or by the author. Um, let me see. What else can I tell you? Uh, we have some project. Anybody else have questions about the books I've talked about? So if you do have a question and you are not uh, good with the chat, please just unmute your microphone and speak up. If we have too many people speaking at once, we'll just um, clear that. Lori Steen, I see, is about to talk. Yeah, uh, Judy, I just was curious if you could continue the story about your mother finding out about the black smoke and what that meant. Oh, sure. Okay, so the, um, the, she was in the bunk with this person from uh, Poland who had been there and had been there several years. And when my mother was talking about meeting her family, um, just in a little, she thought maybe in a little while, the woman said, you see that black smoke over there? That's your family. They're in the crematorium, they're being burned. And my mother looked at her and she goes, what are you saying? Why would you say that? And she said, because you'll see, you're never going to see them again. So imagine she's 17 years old, never been away from her family, grew up in a, in a loving, wonderful home with brothers and sisters, um, never thought this was ever going to happen to her. And literally her world changed from one day to the next. Did I answer the question? Um, Lori? I, yes. can't, I can't see anyone, I'm really sorry. Yes, you answered the question and how amazing. Um, what a survivor after all that. 
And it's yeah, and then, you know, as I say, so having survived that, you just get over all the trauma when you get home, pick up your life, and the Hungarian Revolution happens. And now your world is turned upside down again. So it's incredible. It's incredible, uh, the human spirit. It's incredible, uh, the people that they met and the human kindness that they showed that you'll read through the book especially Anna Marie, who is very special, um, and her family, and how they helped my family, even though it was, again, for them, you know, Austria, 10 years after the war, lots of anti-Semitism still mm -hmm. at the time. There was a lot of people who didn't want to get involved, didn't want to help the Jews. So, you know, amazing that they put themselves out there. Um, Absolutely. So I'm going to talk to you a little, anybody with some more questions about these books. Otherwise, I will talk to you about our new projects, which are really exciting. Again, if you do have a question, you can just unmute your mic. Uh, yeah, yeah, if you could just wait, you know, wave and the rabbi will see you because I can't see you at all. <laughs> uh, Judy, for you to see people, you should be able to swipe with your finger right or left. Let's see. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> okay. So did, does anyone have, if you put your hand up, uh, if you do have, do you have any questions about the books that I've talked about? If not, I'm going to go on and move on to, um, to what's going on next. Okay. So I unmuted Hannah Sperber. Right. I was wondering, is there a possibility of the book being at the Chabad here on Lincoln or <clears throat> getting it delivered? Uh, because I, I'd love to read the, uh, the, the book choices. I think I, I, I'm, really... I kind of missed half that conversation. Sorry. So <laughs> she wanted to know, we don't have it on the Lincoln one, um, but I am happy to arrange a delivery, Hannah. It is on Amazon. It's also on her website, Little Egg Publishing. So mm -hmm. I'll share with you those links in an email. Okay. Well, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, if you could put those links on, that would be great. Thank you, Rabbi. Nicole yeah, that's Paul and it is. I said local. It is available locally at the Chabad store in Scottsdale because they asked to have it in their bookstore, and I was like, sure, no, or in their gift store. So they do have it. And I don't know if they're open now, so I'm going to find out. But um, before you uh, move on to your future projects, Nicole Grunberg, you want to ask something? You're unmuted. I just wanted to say that I remember the Hungarian Revolution when I was younger. I heard about it. And it was a very uh, uh, serious uh, event, and I was following uh, the 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 event uh, through the news. I remember that uh, Russia against the Hungarian, and uh, it was a big uh, event to follow. Were you were living in France then? Yes. Yeah. So I remember. And, and you remember the news about the revolution? Yes, because I was uh -huh. following the news. And, and what do you what do you remember? What how do how were people reacting about it? I, I mean, I just read it myself, but I don't know about the reaction of the people because I just re read it, but I did not uh, share with other people. But I remember it was a big, uh, serious uh, event that happened between Hungarian and uh, Russia. I was, uh, yeah, I was touched what, but what it happened. Yes. Yeah. No, it was again, 200,000 people. So it was a pretty big event. Yeah. And again, it was America knew a lot about it because they had it on the cover of Time magazine at the time. It was the cover of Time magazine was about the, the Hungarian freedom fighters and how they died and what had happened and what was going on. So Certainly, it was a major world event. But when I go out to schools, very few of the children have ever heard about it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very interesting for them and interesting to see, to hear about a, a world event. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yes. Anyone yeah. else with... I have another one. I'm sorry, I don't want to take over, but can you give us... Uh, a little synopsis without giving uh, the story away about what happened in choices, what happened in choices or uh, in the hidden pearl. Choices. 
uh, choices. Okay, so, you know, it's very uh, funny because um, uh, people will say to me when I'm uh, at some of the book clubs that they read the book and they were so worried that, you know, what was going to happen to the family, what was going to happen. And, you know, obviously I'm here and I was in the story. I was uh, almost two. So clearly we survived. And um, yeah, so I think the, um, other than giving the story away, I think the story, um, obviously it's a happy ending. You know, we ended up in Montreal, Canada. Our family, I grew up in Montreal, Canada. We were brought to Canada. Many of the survivors, actually many of the survivors of the revolution, um, ended up in Canada and ended up in Montreal, interestingly enough. At the time, in the United States, there was a quota, and so many people couldn't get in. Canada was an easier place for them to, to go to. Um, so, yeah, so they ended up in, in Canada. Um, Anna Marie, her family has survived and thrived, and she has grandchildren. She's now in her 80s. Um, her daughter, uh, is her name is Judy, and um, her daughter, they, kind of, they were a family that loved to help people. They, they are very Christian, uh, very involved with the church. They've been involved in a lot of, um, of relief efforts at other times as well. Uh, and um, they, her daughter decided she wanted to be a teacher. And one of the things that was interesting is that having been a teacher myself, that she was a teacher, but she wanted to be a teacher for the blind because she thought the blind were the most vulnerable of the population. So she wanted to find somewhere that she could really make a huge difference. Her daughter, so Anna Marie's granddaughter, is a musician. And she is uh, 20, she was 22, so she must be 25 now. And um, she, again, young adult, musician, you know, you imagine she's going to play the piano, the guitar, the drums, what most young people want to play. She decided she's going to be a master harp player. So she plays the harp, which is literally the, uh, you know, the instrument of the angels. So it's kind of interesting. This family is a fascinating family. And I was thrilled to be able to get their part of the story. But what was it like when they met us? What was it like to take in another family? What was it like for immigrants at the time from their viewpoint? So I think it offers that piece as well, which is very interesting. Uh, Judy, you have a question from the chat. If you can speak about self-publishing. Oh, sure. Okay. So uh, when I started my first book, so which was the Where Did Papa Go book, the children's book, that's what I started with. Uh, when I started that book, um, I sent it to several publishers, to several Main Street publishers, and they liked it. Uh, I had several that wanted to publish. Where I picked one and asked them if they would send me a copy of what the book would look like when it was done, because uh, I really wanted to make sure it was a certain quality. I wanted to be make sure that the colors were good. There were a lot of things that, as uh, an educator, that were important to me and uh, that I wanted to make sure that that was done. So I got a copy of the book and uh, it was very poorly produced. It was produced with almost like newspaper type paper, which as a teacher, I know if you're gonna give it to kids to read, it's gonna be ripped immediately. So that didn't work for me. Um, the cover was also this flimsy cover and that I said, you know what, it's, it, it's, it's not going, it's not, what, it's not the product that I'm looking for and that I want to put my name on. So I started to investigate the self-publishing route. It was at the very beginning of self-publishing, so it was over 30 years ago. And um, I tapped into some people who had been doing some self-publishing. And, uh, and little by little, I learned about it. I learned how to do it. I learned how to, cons to consult with different people. I learned who the printers were. Um, I hired an illustrator. At the time, there were no computers. And um, the illustrator I worked with was a grandfather as well. And he, um, 
he would do the drawings. We would meet together. I, he lived in Phoenix. He's not alive anymore. He lived in Phoenix. He had retired from advertising. He was interested in doing a book that he could leave for his grandchildren as well. And uh, we collaborated on the book, collaborated in the sense that he did the illustrations. I paid him. Um, you know, self-publishing means you take on the financial responsibility of putting the book together. So I had to decide that that was something I wanted to do. And, uh, and little by little, I learned all of the things that, went, that were involved in self-publishing. And again, when I used to buy a book at the library, uh, when I used to pick up a book at the library or buy a book at the bookstore, I never really thought about what goes into making this book. And when I started publishing, a whole new vision. I really understood that there were so many pieces. It needs to be registered with the Library of Congress. It needs to have a library cataloging number. It needs to, you know, it needs to have certain, uh, certain specific uh, instructions. So uh, it, was, it, it was a learning curve. And um, it's something that people have now contacted me. I'm always happy to talk to someone who is interested in doing self-publishing um, with the invent of computers, uh, self-publishing has taken off tremendously. It's, uh, it's a great way to get your book published. If you go uh, the route of traditional publishers, they, uh, they give you maybe five, 10% on a book. Um, they're in charge of everything. They, they're in charge of quality control. You have no control over anything. Um, it, it could take years before somebody even reads your script to even decide if they're going to publish it. So it is a way to get your book out there. Um, right now, 2020, uh, maybe not right now in the middle of the virus, but um, 2020, it's a great time for people who want to self-publish. It's a great way to, uh, to get your book out and get it out in the way you want it and also in a time frame that you'd like it out. So, any questions? Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, yeah, I put it in, but I don't think it went through. Does your company, Little Egg Publishing, is it devoted to only publishing your books, or do you look at other writers' books as well? So, up until now, that's a great question. Up until now, it's been our, my own books that I've published because I've been pretty busy with those with having the two young adult books and the children's books. Uh, but recently I've looked at other authors who are interested in having their book published. And I think down the road, Little Egg will probably be publishing either books that can go into our, uh, our selection of books for social emotional issues for young children or the young adult historical, which I think is another growing area. Okay. So the answer is yes, but not quite yet. We're, we're, I, I haven't come across, I will certainly entertain looking at manuscripts. And, um, and again, with self-publishing, the, the, the author, so that would be the person that writes the book, uh, probably has to think about what they want to invest in having their book published. Because besides the actual printing costs and the actual putting together the book, there's also marketing costs, which is, a, which is a large part of the budget. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions or I'm gonna move on to it, what we're doing next, which is pretty exciting. Last Shall call. I move on? Questions? The cost, what is the question? average? What's the average cost to publish a book, to self-publish? What is the average it's cost? It's about a year. Well, I, I would say, okay, let me back up on that. The children's books are about a year. The, adult, the young adult book, doing it, uh, having had experience in writing, having had experience in publishing, it took three years. What about the cost? What is the approximate cost to self-publish a book? Um, you know, again, it's uh, the children's books are more expensive in that they've got illustrations. So full color, full color illustrations are expensive. Um, you're probably looking at twenty five thousand dollars. 
to do a children's book. Um, the young adult book, it's going to depend on the word count. It's going to depend on what's, you know, what shape I get the manuscript in. Um, does it need editing? Does it need uh, layout work? Um, and that is when I talk about the children's book that all, I, I'm assuming that you're basically giving me a very basic children's story and you don't have illustrations. No, a young adult story. How about young adult readers? For young adult The young readers. adult book. So these books yeah. you're talking about? Something like that, yes. Yes. Possibly. How much yes. would it cost to, yes. to just publish a ballpark. that? So again, I you know it's hard for me to tell you just broadly. Yeah. Um, but you do need to have a budget. You do need to think, I mean, it's several thousand dollars. It's okay. not it's not a hundred dollars, it's not five hundred dollars, okay. it's okay. probably you're probably talking Twenty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. You know, and you're talking about again. So this is when I talk about that. I'm talking about you giving me the manuscript and me giving you printed copies. So again, it depends on the amount of copies you want printed. So I've done my books are typically uh, it's pretty much a small to medium run. I do about uh, two thousand books when I do a print run. I do a traditional uh, printing company that does like the big printing presses. They're now, now a lot of them are, you know, uh, automated, but um, you can do ones that are just um, off of the computer because there's now a lot of technology. So there's desktop publishing. Uh, that's a whole other area. That would be less expensive in terms of your overall cost, more expensive per book. So the reason that I do 2000 is that's been kind of the, the, the price break point in a sense, in that, you know, that keeps the copies at a, a reasonable amount of money for me to then go ahead and mark them up and sell them and send them to a bookstore and let the bookstore make some money on it and not, not be so expensive that nobody can afford it. So there are a lot of pieces that go into it. I think it's, I only realized it once I got involved is how complicated the whole publishing end is. Um, so if you wanted, let's say only five copies, if you wanted just copies for your family, for instance, that would be a completely different thing. There's a lot of people that don't want to publish 2000 copies, for instance. So it's, again, it sort of depends on what are you looking for? Are you looking for uh, this as a business? Are you looking at for it as personal so that you want something for your family? Uh, which by the way, I highly recommend having done this myself and I did it obviously to put out uh, commercially, but I would highly recommend uh, everyone out there getting your story written while you're still here, while you're able to give details. I could never have written a book that was interesting and um, intriguing without the details. Luckily, my mom was alive. Luckily, she still remembered a lot. She uh, was able to provide me with such valuable details that make for an interesting story that um, it would be very different if I had to create it myself, if I made a completely fictional story. This is based on a true story. The book Choices is completely based on a true story. It's the characters' names are the real names of the characters. I have photos in the back of the characters. So when you finish reading the book, which I like to do, I like to actually know who these characters are. Um, but it's written fictionally only because that's an interesting way for people to read. It makes it a much more interesting read, especially for young adults. So it's written a lot in conversation. And so we can't, I can't know for certain and I actually do know for certain that the conversations were not the actual real conversations, but the events are real, the people are real, the dates are real. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a crossover book in that sense. Is it considered a novel then? Beg your pardon? Is it considered a novel then? It's considered a novel, exactly. It's a historical novel is what's, what it's considered. All right, thank you. And now you said you wanted to talk about your the future plans. 
Yes, so very exciting. So Choices, um, when it came out, I got contacted by several um, production companies who are interested in the movie. So they read the story, the book went out to several international markets, and I was picked up by many people who found it an interesting story. It was very current. It was about immigration, refugees, um, had, a had had a Holocaust link. It had the Russia piece, so it was very interesting. So um, I went ahead and hired a script writer, and we now have a script for um, for choices, and um, it's a two-hour movie. There are several companies that I'm speaking to right now. Well, actually, not right now, but before <laughs> before the virus. Um, who are very interested in making this into a movie. They think it has great commercial value. Um, and so I'm in the process of doing that. And that was really exciting um, to just be contacted uh, by the different studios and be told that it was one of the books on their short list that they're interested uh, in working with. Um, the other really interesting thing and uh, exciting thing that's happening at Little Light Publishing is we have a new children's book coming out. So the new children's book is uh, a book called The Very Unhappy Visitor. This is, this is about um, finding your own happiness. So again, the social emotional skills for young children. It's about not blaming others when things don't go your way. It's not blaming uh, if you forgot your whatever homework in your backpack, it's not your mom's fault. It was your responsibility. Um, it's a new character. The new character's name is Shrilly. Shrilly is a character that always screams and yells and always has temper tantrums. I don't know if you know anyone like this, but I'm sure there are people out there that can relate to that, to relate to... Uh, kids who always think that it's someone else's fault. Um, and it's a really, it's again, it's set in the world of Giggleyville. Um, the character goes to Giggleyville. So the idea is uh, Shrilly is an unhappy person within herself. And she goes to Giggleyville, which is basically utopia. I mean, Giggleyville is the best place, is the happiest place in the world. And she can't be happy there. No matter where she goes, no matter what she does, no matter what she sees, which everyone else, all the other characters are happy, she's not happy. And um, in the end, the end of the story, or actually the key piece to the story, the key lesson in the story that, uh, that we want children to learn is that it's how you see things. It's up to you. You can be happy or not. Happiness is your choice. It's the choice you make when you're in a situation and you only see... Um, the negative and you don't see any positive. It's the opportunity to talk to children about that, to talk to them about um, what happened maybe in the day that you went through that day and said, you know, they were upset about something and be able to point out that perhaps it's how they saw it and perhaps it wasn't really how it is. And um, yeah, so I'm very excited about that. Again, it's got great illustrations, colorful in illustrations. It's by the same illustrator that did the Shabbat book and that did the birthday book. Uh, that's the other thing I probably want to tell you from the publishing side. I don't use the same illustrator all the time. Different illustrators do better on different books. And I go through a network of illustrators and I interview them. I look at their work. Uh, I talk to them on the, on the internet, actually. Everything is done online right now. So, um, but I'm really pleased with what we've been able to accomplish with this newest book. And I think, again, from the Jewish side, the idea that um, you own your own happiness is kind of a Jewish value. It's uh, something that, uh, that I think we can relate to Jewishly. Right, Rabbi? Rabbi? <laughs> can you hear me? I, I could. I was trying to unmute my mic. Um, no, I actually think these are great messages. In fact, the last book, uh, I need to get for my kids. <laughs> the one that didn't come out yet. Oh, the one that, it should be out this summer. So we're looking at a summer release. Oh, and, really um, you know, the public, the printing companies aren't that busy. So I'm hoping we can get through quicker. 
uh, the book is really ready to go to print at this point. So it's again, it's been a year, it's been a good um, nine to 12 months in working on it, uh, finding the story that works, finding it in a way that would work well. It's, a, it's done in rhyme. Um, one of the things that in the children's books, uh, so it's meant for young readers. It's meant for, my target audience is four to seven year olds pretty much. So it's children who are not reading yet and parents are reading to them, but are starting to read. They can see some sight words. They can maybe recognize some letters. Um, anyway, the book does help with reading because it's written in rhyme. And as an educator, that is the easiest way for children to learn to read. The visually, the rhyming words are bigger in the print. I'm gonna show you in one of the books so you can see. And also there are other educational pieces. For instance, in Giggleyville, we talk about shapes, we talk about colors, we talk about counting. Um, so here, let's do this one. So this one, for instance, you can see candy and dandy are a little larger than the other words. And they're the rhyming words. So I've given you a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Anybody have questions about anything? Anything about being an author? Anything about um, children's reading or literature? Uh, young adult? Can I ask a question? Sure. Hi. Um, how about how much do you pay an illustrator for a children's book? Obviously it depends on how many pages, how many pictures. But what's the approximate range or uh, rate? So again, so here's the interesting part about that. Everything is kind of, is everything's negotiable and it depends on the author's experience. Has he won, he, has he or she won any awards? You know, so it's kind of like an actor, basically. It's anything that's artistic is there's no real set. Um, it's you, you make a budget. What you do is you create a budget for a book. And then you say, what am I prepared to pay per illustration? Um, the children's books are 32 pages, 32 page illustrations. Some of them are double page illustrations. So what that means is they, they go on to two pages. Uh, let's see what's... So this is a double page illustration. It spreads onto two pages. Some of them are single page illustrations. So those are two completely different illustrations. Right. So it's, um, again, you know, you're talking about somebody depending on what, what kind of book do you want to produce? How, um, how much experience do you want that illustrator to have? There are some really excellent young illustrators that don't charge that much that I have used. And then there are some award-winning illustrators that are obviously phenomenal. And it's a whole other, you know, you're talking a whole other ball game. So it's so kind no of, it becomes your choice. You're saying there's no typical range that you could look at. There's no, it can go from, you know, it's not, again, I wouldn't tell you that it, you can get, you can probably, um, you're probably looking at several hundred dollars per illustration. You're not talking about $25 in illustration. Oh, of course. So, you know, so to give you some range. So when you see these books that are well illustrated, that are beautifully illustrated, they've paid a lot of money for illustrations. They've, they've paid, an illustrator could charge $1,000 an illustration. You know, an award-winning illustrator, you know? It's, um, but everything kind of is, depends on, you know, on who you hire, okay. but it is negotiable. That's the, you know, if you're willing to work with them, if you're willing to, you know, again, your timeline, do you need it in a certain amount of time? Are you willing to wait? Um, those are also issues. Okay. Anyone else? I was an early childhood teacher myself and could you give me the name of the um the new book that you're coming out with oh the newest book yeah yeah it's called the very unhappy visitor 
And can these books be read in a, um, cause you said a lot of them have a Jewish theme to them. Can they be read in a public school? Absolutely, absolutely. To, to jump in, I think when she said Jewish theme, I think she meant Jewish values, which are okay. available for all. Um, so Judy, I'm going to, I guess, do you have a closing thought or? <laughs> um, uh, I think just, um, I'm excited to be in this field. It's, um, it's a creative area. Uh, and if we need to keep kids reading, I think that's, uh, that's the main message. Let's keep kids reading young adults, kids, uh, children, adults, everyone. So thank you very much for having me. Well, thank, thank you very much for uh, presenting and sharing all this information with us. And I just want to, again, remind everyone, you can find these books on her own, on Judy's website, which is littleeggpublishing.com. And as well, she said it's on Amazon. You can get it at the Scottsdale. Just um, look up the author or a title. Okay. So, and it's under J.E. Laufer. Yes. Uh, yes, again, I write under J.E. Laufer. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. And uh, again, if you wanted to walk into a store locally... You can find it at the Mazel Tov gift shop, which is uh, adjacent to Chabad Scott. This is the logo. Logo. Awesome. And Little Egg, just a, a quick um, thought. Little Egg is my maiden name. So my name is Egget Little Egg. That's where Little Egg Publishing comes from. Oh, nice. I like that. Um, I am going to share in tomorrow's email with tomorrow's presenter. I will share um, the link to Judy's website so you can see all of her books that she's published. And um, you can purchase it directly there or, again, at least have the title to purchase it whichever uh, way you would like to purchase it. So, Judy, thank you again. And if anyone, Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anyone, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Um, just